begin by saying good morning and happy Lord's Day. It is good to see each one out this morning. Um, buenos dias. I haven't done this in a while. Feliz dia de el Señor. Right? Close? Good to see each one here this morning. So like I said, before we stand this morning, I want to make a few um, comments. What we're going to consider this morning is what I think is the most important question you will ever be asked, which will lead to the most important response you will ever give. So uh, there are a variety of questions that we ask one another. Um, Some are meaningless, just to inquire about somebody's personal feelings, what's your favorite color, uh, that sort of thing, where do you live, those are to get to know somebody. They change nothing about anything. Um, It's just for knowledge's sake. Um, There are other questions that require a little bit deeper thought and maybe some, for for us who are believers, some prayer. Um, But like, what job are you going to take? You know, if an employer asks you, will you take this job? You want to give it some thought because it's an important question and it will have a short-term effect on your life um, for the time that you're at that job. So, you know, you give it some deeper thought because it requires some uh, some soul searching and um, maybe it includes a wife and some children and maybe a move, relocating. So it inquires a little bit more of a deeper thought. Um, some questions, again, are more of an inquiry of an opinion. Like, um, what do you think about George Washington? Okay, every, every child in America learns about George Washington. We call him the father of our country. So, you know, you kind of go through the things you know about George Washington, but what you think about him doesn't mean anything. It doesn't change anything. We're just going off of historical record. He was a man who lived, did some very good things in his life that we benefit from, and then he died. And he will stand before the Lord and give an account of his life. So these, our opinion in a lot of cases like that is meaningless. It doesn't change anything about your existence. What we look at this morning is a question that Jesus asked his disciples, specifically his apostles. Um, And it requires a lot of soul searching. So at this point, I'm going to ask you to stand as we read our text verse uh, passage, actually, from Matthew chapter 16. I'm going to read verses 13 through 17. So if you know me well, you know that uh, verse 18 is one of my favorite passages. We're going to stop just short of that and consider what led up to Jesus telling Peter that you are Peter on this rock, I will build my church. But we're going to consider what came before that. So starting in verse 13, Jesus says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, Whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed be thou, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come before your throne at this time. We do thank you, first of all, for your goodness and for your mercy, for your watchful care over us. Lord, we thank you for our safe trip here. We thank you for this time we have to gather here this morning to learn from you and your word. We ask, Father, that you be with this reading and the question that is asked as it goes out that we might all consider the importance of this question and what it means to our eternity. Lord, we pray that if there is one here that does not know you as Savior or one listening to this message that does not know you as Savior, Lord, we pray that your spirit would convict and that one might one day respond that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Forgive us, Father, when we fail you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So this is an interesting um, account here, and it probably caught the apostles off guard. And I think this is one of those situations where Jesus, who had been doing many things around this area known as Caesarea Philippi, um, his notoriety was going out very quickly. He had done many miracles. And there was a lot of buzz, a lot of talk about Jesus. And people were wondering, who is he? And they were, you know, saying the things that they thought about him. And we see what the response was, at least some of the things that the apostles were hearing about him. Some say he's a 
Elijah, who had been dead for centuries, come back to life, or Jeremiah, or what, another prophet, um, thinking that God is bringing a prophet back to kind of straighten things out in Israel. So I can kind of see Jesus, you know, listening to their response, maybe smiling and um, kind of responding in sort of a, a way like that. But then he asked them a question. And I don't think they were expecting this question. He said unto them, who do you say that I am? I'm using modern English. And Jesus, of course, didn't speak English at all. But his question was, who do you, his disciples, who are saved, baptized, chosen, picked out from among the crowd, followers of Jesus? They committed their life to him. They gave up everything to follow him, their livelihood to follow him. And yet he still asked this question, who do you say that I am? Now, that, that, just the question itself and the, the context in which it's asked requires some deep thought. What does he mean by that? If I was to ask you, who do you say that I, Steve Waters, the son of Eldon, am? If you know anything about me, uh, you'll say some things where I grew up, you know, my childhood, my relationship with my parents, some of those things. But it's all meaningless. It doesn't change anything. Uh, and they, they weren't thinking that Jesus was asking, well, we know you were born in Bethlehem. You know, he wasn't asking that. He didn't care about that. He wanted to know what they thought about the claims that he was making about himself. And I'm going to consider in a moment some of the things that Jesus was saying about himself, who he was, and some of the things the New Testament tells us centuries later, two millenniums later, about what Jesus or who Jesus actually is. And these claims that Jesus made about himself and the Bible says about him, they are either the craziest things ever said, or they're absolutely true. They can't be both. And a lot of people approach the Bible as if it is both. It's so unbelievable that I'd like to think that it's true, but I'm not 100% sure. I don't want to go to hell, so I'm going to commit myself in some way and say Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Most people know about him. They know who he is. The world, I'm going to say, maybe not even quite half, but a lot of people celebrate his birthday. I think his birthday is celebrated probably more than any other man's birthday that has ever been born. But what does that mean? Who is he? Why, why is he so popular? And considering this question, who is he really? Was he a diabolical man who just uh, was a narcissist? You know, Wanting to know what people think. We all want to be liked, right? I, I kind of like to know what people think about me. But sometimes I don't. <laughs> sometimes I know without asking what people think about me. But it doesn't matter. It means absolutely nothing what people think about me or anybody else. But what we think about Jesus is of eternal importance. So this question, that's why I say this question is the most important question you will ever be asked and it is the most important response that you will ever give. So, I'm going to ask all of you, and anybody who may be listening, to give careful thought to how you respond to this question. Don't just say, oh, he's the son of God. Yeah, you're right, he is. But if you don't really believe it, if that's just you're just saying what you've heard throughout history, it doesn't mean anything to you. This has to be a response that comes from your deepest conviction. And that's what Peter does. He doesn't just give a response off the cuff. He gave, and Jesus knew um, that when Peter said this, that it was genuine, it was real. Let's look at this again. Just, just Peter's response in verse 16. Peter responded or answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. What exactly does that mean? What does it mean? It means that everything about the prophecies concerning the Messiah, the Son of God, what Peter is saying here, that he is the fulfillment of all of those prophecies. All of them. Um, and yet there's more to come also. But Peter had enough faith and knowing who Jesus is that he said, you not only fulfilled many of the prophecies, but there's more to come that we understand you are going to fulfill. But to show how fickle we are, when it came right down to it, the one concerning his resurrection, they didn't really believe it. 
They, they, they weren't there on the third day. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. But then Jesus' response to Peter shows how, how serious in understanding Peter was when he said this. He said unto Peter, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. The only way a person's response can have any meaning whatsoever is if God reveals the answer to them. There was no other evidence. Um, The prophecies are evidence of sorts, but what's interesting about the prophecies being fulfilled is that those that should have known all of these things, which were the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, not only did they not believe he was the Messiah, even though all of the evidence pointed pointed to it at that time, They hated him with a passion, and they wanted him killed because he was a threat to their ministries, their livelihoods, their their financial goals, was all tied up in this religion that speaks about the Messiah, that speaks about the Son of God, and yet when he comes and fulfills all of the prophecies, they hate him because he's disrupting their lives. They did not believe, even though all of the the evidence, flesh and blood, were showing this. Uh, prophets died showing that their conviction and what is talk that the Old Testament is talking about. But even more than that, I've often wondered this. How, how were people prior to the death of Christ saved? Now you know the answer to that. A lot of you do. It's not all of you that are here. We know that we're saved by... All of the evidence that's there, and not only that, the preaching of the word and all of that, okay? It points to the fact that Jesus did live, fulfilled all the prophecies, died on the cross. People know that. I mean, in their heads, they know the story, but it's not in here. So the the flesh and blood has not revealed it to them. They're not understanding it. Peter's response isn't because he saw anything that proved it to him, it's because God revealed it to him. And the only way a person, a lost soul, can come to this kind of understanding is by several things taking place. Because evidence is rather meaningless. People saw Jesus raise a man from the dead and they still didn't believe. How much more evidence do you want? And there, in some cases, in John chapter 11, when Jesus did raise Lazarus, it says some believed, of course, but... Some, they wanted to even further step up their efforts to kill him. And it wasn't very long after that to where he was killed. So physical evidence, the things of this earth, the material things, flesh and blood, all of that, it doesn't mean anything. Okay? It has to be something that God convicts you about. God lets you know as an individual that you are a lost sinner. In fact, that's something that I think God has to reveal to somebody as well. And once a person understands that they're a lost sinner, then comes the question, as was asked in uh, Acts chapter 8, what must I do to be saved? Nope, that's Acts 16. There's two great accounts in there. But when somebody came to that conviction that he's a lost sinner, Acts chapter 16, the Philippian jailer, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to make right what is so terribly wrong? And the only answer to that is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. The moment you believe, you will be saved. So Peter, back at this, Peter's not, I don't think he's saved at this point. I think he already is saved. But this is a question that every person has to consider, has to answer. And there's different levels of how you respond to the answer to this question. Because a lot of people are already saved. But perhaps their, their dedication to all of this is, is wavering. It's, not, it's questionable. They're not, they haven't really fully committed themselves to this. In fact, after this point, in fact, not too long after this point, um, Peter makes a very bold proclamation that when Jesus says that I'm going to die and three days later I'm going to raise, Peter says, oh, hold on. We're, we're not going to let you die. Don't, don't worry about that, Lord. We got your back. <laughs> and Jesus had to correct Peter twice. 
because of his boldness, um, not understanding that that has to happen. So he, he was he wasn't fully convinced convinced, and I'm not, I'm not sure if it's Peter who at one point said uh, he said one of the apostles said, "Lord, we believe, but help our unbelief." All of us are growing in this understanding of faith in Christ. It doesn't all come at once. They've been followers for quite some time. But yet this question, Peter answers very directly and boldly and says, with confidence, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He believed. Everybody must consider that. Now, there's a lot of people, and I was one of those, who was very agnostic, okay? Even though I was raised um, in faith, I mean, believing in something. I believed in Jesus. I knew, I knew that Jesus was the Son of God because I was always taught that from the time I was a child, that Jesus was the Son of God. But it didn't mean anything to me. I didn't know what it meant. Um, Until I began to hear the Word of God preached. And then I had to search my soul and really ask myself the question, what do I really believe about this? Because I had come to a point months prior to that, this taking place, that there is a God. Okay, I, I kind of wavered about that even, because I was going to public school. <laughs> um, and they raised a lot of questions. Well, did we come from apes, monkeys? Did we evolve over millions of years? I, I didn't quite believe that, but I didn't know. Where did we come from? How did this all happen? Why are we here? Why are we even asking these questions? And then, all of a sudden, um, it, an atheist proved to me that there is a God. I'm thankful for that person. Um, I hope she came to a point, point as a professor in college that she ended up believing and being saved. Um, but at that point, she didn't. But she convinced me that there's a God, but that didn't change anything about me. And then I started to consider a lot of things. What do I believe about religion? So I did, I, I, I brought, it wasn't here, but at the Rialto Church, I, um, I, I brought in stacks of books that I had bought at the time for to, to research, to read. Church history, books about faith, all these things I, I read because um, I wanted to learn more about what, what do I believe? What do I really believe about what the Bible says? And those books were fine. I think I still have a few of them. A lot of books I have now are digital, so it eliminates the, the need for hard copies. But those didn't prove anything to me. They didn't convince me of anything. It made me further desire to search. But it was when the gospel was preached is when I began to be affected inside. And this question had to be answered by me and nobody else. It had to be answered by me. What do I or who do I believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is? Um, And then on September 12th, 1983, I was so convicted, so convinced that I literally went down to the altar, which I would never would have done because I was so shy back then. That's really what kind of held me back. But when the invitation song was given, I walked down the, to the altar and I put my faith in Christ. But if you heard me tell this story before, um, I, I was actually saved sitting in my pew. That's when God revealed it to me. The physical response of showing that I had accepted it was walking down to the altar the pastor asking me the question, um, is everything okay? My response was, I need to be saved. I didn't know, I had no idea what was going on. So we prayed, and I <clears throat> I just had this incredible peace that everything was okay. But as I thought back on it, I knew that it was at the time that God revealed it to me. So, and that that's how this the answer to this question comes. It you can't study these things. It's, it's not a mystery to be figured out. This is something God reveals. What we know in the New Testament is that God's desire is that every soul, every person born into this world, comes to a place of faith and then grows in that faith. Every soul. Jesus died for all men. So let's consider some things a little bit further here. To, to give like maybe a perspective to this question, and, and really why it is so important, the most important question, is because either Jesus Christ is 
the manifestation of God himself? Either that's true, because that's what the Bible says. All right? Everything points to that is the statement, that's what the Bible wants us to believe. Or, he is the biggest liar and fraud that has ever lived. Deceiving millions upon millions of men, women, and children over the course of two millenniums, 2,000 years, many giving their own lives because of their faith in him. And if he's not who he said he was, it was all for nothing. There have been other men who have been sort of um, narcissistic like this. I'm not saying Jesus was narcissist because I believe it to be true. However, if he was not the son of God, if he was not who he says he was, then he was no different than any other man who, who gets a great following because he's a great speaker, causes people to believe in him, to worship him, to die for him. But it's all for nothing. There's no way. The, the Christianity is so unique among all of the religions of men that there is no claim by any one person such as this. And yet, it's, I, I think, statistically speaking, I think it's the second largest religion, participation-wise. I think um, Muslim is number one by, by the vast numbers of people that are dedicated to Muhammad, who was born probably 600 years after Jesus, a historical figure um, who himself claimed that Jesus was a good prophet. But not even Muhammad claimed to be what Jesus claims to be. He claimed to be sent by God, and there have been millions of men and women and children who have died because of their faith for Muhammad, okay, for the Muslim faith. But not even Muhammad said the things that Jesus says. He can't be, he can't be both God and just a good man if he's not who he says he was. In fact, Jesus said when somebody addressed him as good teacher, he said, no man is good, but one, but God. God's the only good one. So all the claims he made, he said about himself, he's saying that he is God. And, and the Jewish faith was right in wanting to stone him for what he said. And they finally had him admit it in one occasion. He said, before Abraham was, I am saying that, that he was around even before Abraham came into existence. And they knew what he said. He said it intentionally because that's the fact. That's who he is. He is God in the flesh. But they thought, now we got him. He committed blasphemy. He claims to be God. And they couldn't apprehend him because it wasn't his time. But either he was, and, and please forgive me for if this sounds like irreverent. I don't mean to be irreverent. Because I believe absolutely without question that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. I believe he is who the Bible says he is. But if he's not, he was the most diabolical, self-absorbed narcissist that ever lived. You have to decide. You need to decide for yourself. If he truly is the son of God, God incarnate, or if he is just a fraud. What does the Bible say about it? Consider, I mean, we're intelligent 21st century people, right? We think, we understand how life begins and how life procreates. What does the Bible tell us about the birth of this man? That he was born of a virgin. Okay, folks, that's not possible. It's not possible. Now, I know what you're thinking. Because you're believers. With God, all things are possible, right? But to somebody who doesn't quite have that understanding yet, you're asking me to believe that a man was born by a virgin. Is that what I'm asking people to do? When I try to plead with people to come to faith in Christ, I'm asking them to believe that he was born of a virgin. You know what, sadly... Um, Many Christian, so-called Christian pastors don't fully believe that. If he was not born of a virgin, then he was a self-absorbed, diabolical, 
narcissist who claimed to be God. But what does the scripture tell us? He was born of a virgin. You have to believe that. You can't, you can't second guess it. If, if he was born of a, of a woman who had a relationship with a man, he is no different than you and I. And it's like me putting my faith in George Washington, which does absolutely nothing to me in my relationship to God. But everything hinges on the fact that what Jesus asked, who do you say that he is? You must believe that he was born of a virgin. I'm not going to go to the prophecies and the fulfillments of it um, in this, because I, I believe you all know that. In John chapter 1, verses 1, to 4, I, verses 1 through 4, I do want to read these, even though they're so familiar to you. Perhaps there's somebody listening who hasn't really considered this in this perspective, but this is speaking about this one who's asking this question of us. And by the way, that question was asked of the, to the... Uh, to the apostles, then it was asked directly to Peter. But by extension, it's, it's a question for every single person who's able to understand, who do you say that Jesus is? Well, this is what the Bible says about Jesus. See if you're in harmony with this. This is about Jesus, what John the Apostle says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, so far, that's believable. The same, he's talking about Jesus, was in the beginning with God. Now you start to go, hmm, what's he trying to tell us here? What is John trying to say about Jesus? George Washington never had this said. Was, was he born with the, the purpose of being the father of our country? Well, maybe by God's plan and design, that was probably true. But he didn't know that. That wasn't his purpose. He wasn't born of a virgin in Virginia and all of that. But this tells us that the same, meaning this word, was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made. That was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. What John's telling us here is that this word is... A person, okay? And to, to take any guesswork out of it, if we could jump down to verse, I'm going to start in verse 11. The key verse is 14, but let's look at verse 11. So verse 11 says that he was in the world and the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. Okay, is this what we must believe? Is this what the Bible is asking us? Do we believe that Jesus Christ made the world and all that in it, that is in it? If we believe that, what we're saying is that he is God. There's only one God. So the Bible's telling us that he, Jesus, is this God. Verse 12 says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the power or the right to become themselves the children of God, even to them who believe in his name which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Every person is born of the will of man. To a man and a woman come together in love and have a child. That child is the product of their love. There's only one way childbirth takes place. And yet the Bible's telling us that Mary, Jesus' mother, at the time she conceived Jesus up until her, the birth of Jesus, never knew a man. Never had a relationship with him. He was not born of flesh and blood. He was born of some other source. We know that source was the Holy Spirit coming upon her. Now to clarify it all, in verse 14, John makes it very clear. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, John wrote this years and years after his time spent with Christ on the earth. I don't, I don't know exactly how many, I think 30 or more years after this point. All these apostles, they, they continue to, in the faith, every one of them dying a martyr's death at some point years later, except for this one, John. We know that he was martyred to the Isle of Patmos, where he wrote Revelation. 
Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 1. I'm trying to put myself in a position of somebody who doesn't know. Somebody who doesn't believe. Okay? What man in their right mind would say something like this? In John chapter 14, verse 1. You believe in God. Believe also in me. What man would say that? Unless he is God. You see that how important this question is? It, it is a vital question. It, immediately, immediately you can just dismiss it and say he was just a man. Some people do that. That's why I'm asking people who may listen to this, and I hope it comes across somebody who might listen to it, don't just answer what you've been groomed to say. He was a good prophet. He was a good religious leader. He started a good work. He did many good things. He healed, he healed people. He caused the blind to see. He raised the dead. He was a good man. But they don't believe that he is God. If he was not God, even though he did, did those good things, he is not a good man. There's been a lot of good people in the world who did many good things. They give of themselves endlessly for a cause that they believe in. But it doesn't mean that they're God. It means that they were a good person. They did good things. What Jesus says and what these verses tell us is that if it's not true, even though he did those things, he's not a good man. He's a liar. He's a fraud. And there are, you know as well as I do, that there are deceptive deceptive people in the world who are trying to get followings of people, usually to make money, usually to get their own, to uh, lift up their own self-absorbed ego. Well, that's not who Jesus was. And the question that he asked, who do you say that I am, is not for his benefit. It's not that he just wants people to love him endlessly. It's for your benefit, uh, the answer that you give. It's for your benefit who you say he is. It's not for his benefit. He, he, okay, he gains things, but people believe, of course. But think about this. Prior to create any created thing whatsoever, God was perfectly content by himself. Always. And yet he made us for a particular purpose. In ways for him, so that he can get glory and honor from us, of course. But largely it's for us, so that we can have this relationship with him. Is it all just, um, as many people think, just uh, books that were written, collected, put together to deceive people? Is that what it was all about, or is it true? That's the question. In John chapter 14, 6, the same passage as when he said, You believe in me, believe also in God. He says this. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Then he, as, as diabolical as that is, or as narcissistic as that is, if he's not God, he says this, No man comes to the Father but by me. What man in his right mind would say something like that? You can't get to heaven unless you come through me. I am the gate. I am the door. I am the one that is the way to heaven. Who would say something like that if he's not who he says he is? If he's not who the Bible says he is. Somebody once said that Christianity, about Christianity, and I've said this before, but if true, Christianity is of infinite importance, eternal importance. If false, it's of zero importance. Completely meaningless. It cannot be both. It can't be both important and not important. It cannot be, it, it is one or the other. Jesus Christ himself, the author of Christianity, is either God, as the Bible says, as he says, or he is the biggest fraud. And we have all been sold a bill of goods. If it wasn't for Christ in your life, okay, what would you be doing? I'd probably be retiring from uh, the grocery store by this time as a store manager, hopefully higher than that, <laughs> making a lot of money. Those people make a lot of money. I walked away from that when I became a Christian. 
people I know now at that time who have are going on to retire, they're you know cruising the world, going on different trips and all that. Um, that's probably what I'd be doing. I wouldn't even be married to Susan if it wasn't for Christ. I'd be married to somebody else. I wouldn't have the kids that I have if it wasn't for Christ. I don't regret any of that because I believe it. I believe it's it's it it has most certainly been worth everything. But so a person not in this position has this question dangling before them that many people they don't want to they want to hear. Why do people not go to church? Because they don't want to hear it. They'll watch it on TV just enough to hear a little bit to make them feel good, and you can find that all over the place. Make you feel good about who you are and how God loves you and how God won't send anybody to hell and that how in the end we're all going to get to the same place. Well, that's not what this Bible says. That's not what Jesus said. What he said was, I am the only way. So again, either he's the biggest liar that ever lived or he is who he says he is. And if you're still in Matthew chapter 16, which I don't think you are, because I think you went somewhere else with me. But back in chapter 16, let's look at this. Just a little bit further down uh, in the same dialogue. In verse 21, Jesus tells these same disciples who he asked that question to. It says, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem. Okay, that's fine. That's a physical act. Many people went to Jerusalem. How he must suffer many things. That seems on course because he was causing a lot of trouble. People hated him. They wanted to see him dead. So he was going to suffer um, among the elders and chief priests and the scribes. And then he was going to be killed. Then he was going to be killed. Okay? Well, if things kept going on that course, then yes, that would be his end. He'd be killed. Like every other false prophet, he'd be killed. End of story. We wouldn't be here right now. But then he says this. Jesus says this. Be raised again the third day. Be raised again the third day. Who would say something like that? Okay, especially this. I, I could see it if he would just say, and be raised again. That's open-ended, okay? We could still be here 2,000 years later waiting for him to come out of the grave. I believe he's going to come out of the grave. And that's my hope. But the thing is, he, he put a time frame on it, okay? You, some of you have heard me enough over the years. Brother Sammy loves this because it's a baseball analogy. Like Babe Ruth, who's standing at the plate, pointed to center field as if to say, this next pitch, I'm going to hit over the center field wall. He called his shot. And then Babe Ruth, what did he do? He hit the next pitch over the center field wall. The home run hurt round the world. He called his shot. Okay? That's what Jesus is doing here. Three days after he dies. He's going to raise up, which means that, okay, there's a time frame there. Three days after he dies, either he comes out of the grave alive or he doesn't. If he doesn't, end of story, Christianity's dead. They're probably all going to be arrested and tried and convicted for causing this uproar in Israel for three years. But guess what, folks? The claim is that he came out of the grave. That he came out of the grave. Everybody knows that, right? Easter Sunday, we celebrate it every year. But do people really believe it? I'm going to have to go out on a limb here and say no. I don't think most people who celebrate what we call Easter Sunday really believe that Jesus came out of the grave. I'm not God. I can't judge them. But their life would tell differently if they really believed it. This is amazing stuff. Let's consider a little bit more. In Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. And verse, uh, let me see where I want to start. 
verse 12. Paul's letter to the church in Colossae, Asia Minor, area of Greece at the time. So the gospel is spread out of Jerusalem into the known part of the world at that time. And this is what Paul says to these Greek believers, largely. Uh, verse 12, let me get to verse 12. Okay, so verse 12, Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. I'll begin with this, giving thanks unto the, uh, the right passage. Chapter 1, okay, everything lines up. Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who both have delivered, uh, who have both delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom, Jesus, the Son of God, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now, listen to what this says about Jesus, okay? Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. This not only did things not change about this claim that Jesus is God, but it gets it gets deeper in understanding. Okay? He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him, by Jesus, were all things made, created. Were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Not just the things that you can see and feel and touch and all that, but the things you can't see. The angelic world was all created by him, and it tells us for him. Now, he's been dead for 30 to 40 years when this letter was written. He's gone. But we also know this, that the claim is that he ascended to heaven is the right hand of the Father, overseeing and governing his church from his throne in heaven. They didn't lose hope. They didn't lose faith. They didn't change the dialogue. They kept it the same. And not in, in no place, contrary to what some, quote, Christian faiths teach, at no, no point anywhere in the New Testament does it change to make us equally God with him. You and I will never be God. He is the only one. We are the children of God. We are, we are sons of God. We can be his bride, but we will never be God. Never. He is God from the beginning. He had no creator. He, he was self-existent. Okay? Don't ask me to explain that because I can't. But he was self-existent. You and I are not self-existent. I need breath to live. I came into existence nine, uh, I'll say nine years, that'd be a long gestation period, uh, nine months prior to January 16th, 1962, I came into existence nine months before that. That's when I was conceived, that's when my life began. Jesus has no starting point. He's God. He's claiming that, but again, my question is, what man would, say, would claim stuff like that? And this Bible supports it in every way. Uh, I'm going to continue here. Verse 17, it says that he is before all things, and by him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. And it goes on and on with claims like this. I want to look at one other one in Colossians chapter 2. One verse here says this, and this one, this one actually really got me when I was soul searching as I was pondering this question who do I say that Jesus Christ is this one really got to me verse 9 in Colossians chapter 2 says this for in him dwells all of the fullness of the Godhead bodily he is God he is God I want a, a couple other passages as we begin to close out this morning. Philippians, I went the wrong way. Philippians chapter 2, we read this. Uh, 
In verse 10, Paul writes this to the church in Philippi. He says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and of things in earth and of things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Every tongue must confess. The question is interesting because it requires a thoughtful response by the hearer of the question. But your response, it doesn't change anything. Okay? The fact is... We're lost in sin. We need a Savior. The only way to be saved is by faith in him. So your response, if if you affirm that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you believe it in your heart, yeah, it changes you eternally. Okay, you become a child of God at that point. Nothing changes about the big picture, though. You're added to it. And for for a lost person who dismisses it, doesn't give it a second thought, doesn't want to believe, doesn't want to change their life. They see no reason. They look at this and say, no way. There's no way a man can be God. It doesn't change anything either. It affects them personally in that their destiny is hell for all of eternity. I don't have time to go into all of that. But that's the fact for them. And their rejection of it doesn't change anything. It doesn't change anything at all. In fact, some people who die rejecting Christ They have a a genealogy of people, sometimes, who have put their faith in Christ, who have believed in him, who are in glory with Christ in heaven in one way or another because they're believers. And here their descendants say, no, I don't want any part of that. I don't believe it. How can a man be God? I don't believe it. Well, the only thing it changes is their destiny. The The truth cannot be changed. This question is is very interesting. That's why I say, before you answer the question, who do you say that Jesus is, think long and hard about your response. If your response is going to be, nah, I'm not buying it, that's fine. You have that ability to do that. But you're going to pay the consequences according to this word. Your response doesn't change the fact that there is a God and Jesus is that God. But if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and you're convinced that all the verses that I read, which are just a small portion of what the Bible says, if you're convinced of that, and you believe it with your heart, confess it with your mouth, and you will be saved. That's the guarantee that we have. Last passage, Acts chapter 26. Going the wrong way again. Acts chapter 26, Paul now is having a conversation with um, some really high people. My dad used to say muckety mucks. (laughs) People that are high on the totem pole. (laughs) Uh, A man named Felix, a man named Agrippa. He's standing before kings and authorities declaring his faith. And I don't have time to go through the whole dialogue here, but I want to start in verse 24. Paul was a smart man, highly educated. Best university around in Tarsus he went to. He was educated religiously by a man named Gamaliel. He knew what he was doing. In fact, initially, he was not a believer in Christ. He wanted to see all Christians put to death. But then, of course, he had a change of heart on the road to Damascus. And that's what he's talking about in this situation here, how Christ changed his life and how for the past number of years he has been dedicated to preaching this one whom at one point he hated with a passion because he didn't believe it. So I want to start in this dialogue here he's having. In verse 24, it says, As he thus spoke for himself, giving a defense of who he is and his relationship with Christ and all that, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning has made you mad. But he said, Paul said, I am not mad, most noble Festus. But speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knows of these things before whom I also speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from your from from him, and the thing that has done it was done in a corner. Nothing's been hidden. Everything's revealed. 
Agrippa heard of these things. Festus heard of these things. But they haven't done anything with it. They've given no consideration to this. Um, in verse 27, now Paul says this. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. He believed the prophets. But he hadn't yet been sold or con was convinced that Jesus Christ is the one that they're talking about. So Paul says, I know that you believe these things. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, You almost persuade me to be a Christian. Almost persuade me to be a Christian. I wonder if Brother Sam's picking up on this hint. Mm -hmm. Almost persuaded means nothing. You might know. You might know Jesus is the Son of God. You might walk the walk, talk the talk, as they say. But if you've never committed in your heart, your soul, to Jesus Christ, it doesn't mean anything. Almost persuaded. For, for years, I was almost persuaded. Specifically, for several weeks, I was almost persuaded. And then one Sunday morning, I was so convinced, so convicted, I was fully persuaded. Without a doubt, I believed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I could see it with my heart's eyes and know that all of this is true. It changed me. It can change everybody who sees the, the scriptures for what they are as absolute truth. It's not partially true. It's not pick and choose what you think is true. It's either all true or none of it's true. In fact, I've had this thought that either Jesus Christ is who the entire Bible says he is, or not only, if he's not, it not only means the, the entire Bible, it's, it's a package deal, okay? If he's not who he says he was, it doesn't just mean that the Bible is not true. I hate to say this, but there's no other evidence that there is a God. And these foolish knuckleheads that believe in evolution and Big Bang Theory, are they right? As far as I see it, those are the only two options we have. Either you came from nothing or you came from this. There's nothing in between. There is no alternative. There's been no prophet that claims any other way. Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. So the question is, who do you say that Jesus Christ is? I told you who I say he is. The burden now falls on those of you, and I know many of you, I know your testimony, I know you share my conviction. But the question is, what about you? We're going to stand at this time. And